source of fresh water in the world. A life-giving force that has nourished wildlife and people since the dawn of time. They are the world's largest inland waterway. A life-shaping force that sparked wars, built empires, and helped forge the destiny of two nations. They are the epicenter of some of the world's most destructive weather. A deadly force that's taken thousands of ships and countless lives. Life-giving life-shaping, life-destroying. The Great Lakes, a powerful force. Carved by mammoth ice sheets during the last glacial age, the Great Lakes hold more than one-fifth of the world's fresh water. Forests, marshes, and wildlife of astonishing diversity thrive here. For centuries, the bounty of the lakes drew native peoples to these shores. The European explorers braved the unknown to forge a lifeline of trade and transport. In their wake came entrepreneurs, inventors, builders, and dreamers who flooded into the new frontier. Grain, lumber, and iron ore fuel new industries. The Great Lakes cities became the powerhouse of the American Industrial Revolution. Its waterways providing a vital link to trade in the U.S. and beyond. As goods flowed out of the region, people poured in. This was where immigrants could find the American dream. But for some people, the dream became a nightmare. Collisions, fires, and human error were often fatal. For others, the deadly force was man himself. Battles were fought over the control of these waters. Some of our nation's greatest warships were forged here. But 
the deadliest force came from nature. The lakes are so big, they create their own weather. The lake effect. The region has weathered more than just storms. But through it all, the lakes are still vibrant to those who work here. And to those who play here. as vital and essential to the world as they have always been. And still as primally beautiful as they were thousands of years ago when first carved from rock. Superior, Michigan, Huron, Erie, Ontario, wellspring of life, shaper of destinies, destroyer of life, the Great Lakes, a powerful force. All right, well, welcome to to the museum and the state of the state of the museum here in Toledo. Um, and for those that are here, um, I'm glad we could have Paul Amar narrate the, the, the sound while those online could hear it. Um, the Great Lakes, a powerful force, a force that's laid the foundation for the great city of Toledo and many other cities across the region. When the National Museum of the Great Lakes relocated to Toledo and opened its doors in 2014, it jump-started an era of new opportunity on the east bank of the Toledo's Maumee River. What brought this organization to the banks of the Maumee River after flourishing somewhere el elsewhere for 70 years, how has this museum leadership constructed a dynamic foundation for ongoing growth locally, regionally, and nationally? Where does the organization see its maritime roots spreading? And how will this vision be realized? This is what we plan to showcase over our time today with you, our friends, our community stakeholders, our members, and advocates. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Barker, a president of Interlake Steamship Company and the chairman of the board of the National Museum of the Great Lakes. I am honored here to be to, here today with all of you here. Um, it's great to see some of our young, young students from the Maritime High School as well um, joining as, as what, what an important role uh, they will play in the future. But um, I'm really excited here to be at our first state of the museum showcasing how we're connecting our communities, especially the Toledo community, to their maritime roots while introducing you to our plans for an exciting decade of growth to come. To get us started, I want to welcome our Executive Director of the Great Lakes Historical Society and the National Museum of the Great Lakes, Chris Gilchrist, to, among other, um, um, <clears throat> to join us uh, to, among other things, share a bit about our organization histories and the road to Toledo. Toledo uh, Chris has done just an incredible job for us uh, and, and continues to do that job for us at the museum, and I can't thank him enough. And, uh, and uh, Chris, and I should not do what I just did because I just screwed up the entire I will presentation. I will. At, least you, at, least, at least Mark didn't shuffle it, you know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Okay. Duluth, Milwaukee, Chicago, Windsor, Cleveland, Buffalo, and Toronto. What do all of these cities have in common besides the fact that they're located on the Great Lakes? Each, oops, 
each could have been the home to what is now right here surrounding us, the National Museum of the Great Lakes. Yet we chose Toledo. Why? Since people first settled, oops, I'm actually ahead of myself. Since people first settled here, uh, the Maumee River and the Port of Toledo have played a vital role in our region, from the earliest peoples living alongside and fishing in its waters, to shipbuilding and becoming a Great Lakes shipping hub, to passenger travel and recreational activities like fishing and boating and more. Toledo's connection to the Maumee River and the Great Lakes runs deep. Suffice to say, Toledo was not a newcomer to Great Lakes history. Likewise, the Great Lakes Historical Society, which owns and operates the National Museum of the Great Lakes, is also not new to Great Lakes history. Not always understood, when we opened our museum's doors at this location in 2014, our organization had been in existence since the end of World War II. For nearly 80 years now, our mission and impact has evolved. From our early years of formation in the Cleveland Public Library System to the opening of the Wakefield Museum and then Inland Seas Maritime Museum uh, in Vermilion, Ohio, to our present day location here in Toledo, we have been sharing Great Lakes history since 1944, not only by operating museums, but by publishing our award-winning qu quarterly Inland Seas Journal, conducting original underwater archaeological research, and educating children and adults alike. As a history museum, the scope of our collecting and exhibiting run activity is deep. We cover all five of the Great Lakes, as well as the diversity of historical topics, from commercial shipping to lighthouses, from shipwrecks to recreational sailing, from uh, recreational fishing to life-saving in the process of industrialization, the Great Lakes represent 84% of the North American continent's fresh water, and there is a different story in every drop. When we opened here in Toledo, we began with a vision to, be, to truly become the National Museum of the Great Lakes. By our, uh, our first wave of growth, opening the facility here began that journey, but the initial wave will only take us so far. The last step of this first wave of growth is moving our vast collection and storage from Vermilion to a local faci facility here in Toledo. Thanks to an $18,000 grant we received from Ohio History Connection, we, are now, uh, we, we can now more efficiently utilize 90% of our collection that remains in storage. It may seem hard to believe, but as you look around this museum that is full of artifacts, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We have so many more stories to share, but not nearly enough space to share them. To help, sp to help spread our message, oh. um, okay, I'm sorry about that. To, yeah, yeah. Okay. To help spread our uh, uh, message to beyond our walls, uh, we sought new ways to reach uh, the public beyond visiting our facility. Since 2020, nearly a dozen partnerships have been forged, including exhibit installations this past year at Toledo Express Airport, onboard American Queen Voyages Great Lakes cruise ships at the Toledo County Public uh, Library main uh, library facility, and at the Ohio State House in Columbus. By partnering near and far, we bring our mission to more people. We carry Toledo's banner across the Great Lakes, and we embrace the aspiration of being the National Museum of the Great Lakes, uh, a museum that uh, assists other maritime and historical organizations in their efforts to preserve history. Additionally, we continue to build relationships through participation of our staff in leadership roles in association, associations such as the Association of Great Lakes Maritime History, the Ohio Museum Association, and the Council of American Maritime Museums. But the need for more physical space in uh, Toledo grows at, at, at this museum. Great Lakes history, as does all history, only expands with time. We simply have so many more short stories to share. Today, I'm excited to show our new future plans of physical growth 
uh, let me uh, in present our second wave expansion. And now. Relocating to Toledo was, was both, I think, in some ways the easiest decision we've made and the hardest decision we've made. Hard because we were leaving our home in Vermilion that had been our home for almost 60 years. Uh, and you don't do that lightly. Once we made that decision to relocate out of Vermilion, was one of the easiest decisions we made because Toledo offered so much as a potential home for our museum. The decision to relocate our facilities to Toledo was predicated on uh, having access to the Willis B. Boyer to rechristen it and repaint it and restore it as the Colonel James M. Schoonmaker and move that to the museum so that people could have a seamless experience from uh, going through the museum and seeing all the history to being able to experience that history firsthand on the Schoonmaker, which made our opening in 2014 possible. We knew right from the beginning that every square foot of space that we could possibly use in the museum was going to be used for exhibit purposes or the museum store. And right now, if we want to attract traveling exhibits, we need dedicated space. One of the things that makes the expansion so important is our ability to tell the stories that we don't currently have the space to tell in the main museum. There's so many stories we have that we aren't able to tell um, because of just our limitations today. And this second wave will allow us to continue to build upon all those great stories. The beginning of this second wave was really led by the donation of the St. Mary's Challenger Pilot House. This is now that first piece and everything is getting built around it. The St. Mary's Pilot House is a really amazing artifact. It's, it's the pilot house of a ship that plied the waters of the Great Lakes for over a hundred years. It, a ship that was built before the Titanic. We were able to, to get this amazing artifact and bring it to Toledo. And, and we are now gonna expand around that pilot house and expand the building and, and the spaces to integrate it. It's the true anchor of the second wave expansion. Taking a project like this from abstract to reality, uh, we, had, we do have some experience with because we, we created the National Museum of the Great Lakes. When you take a project from the abstract to the real, it's, it's, it's an exciting thing to experience, but it's also kind of scary. You think you know what you're doing. You have this idea. Granted, it's just a concept, and then it starts to get draft it out on, on a plan and you, you look at the floor plan and you're like, okay, and I know what this is. And you think about how the exhibits are gonna go in there. And then the architects come through with this 3D rendering and all of a sudden you're like, holy cow, this, this, this is really happening. This is really it. This is, this is what we've been looking for and I can feel it now. I know what it is.
Thank you. We are thrilled to be working with the Collaborative and the Lathrop Company on this incredible second wave of growth and have entered into the design development uh, stage of our expansion with the intent to break ground on this project in the spring of 2024. And it is through this second wave of expansion that we believe we can fully live up to our name as the National Museum of the Great Lakes. With that, I'd like to turn over the next part of this update over to Kate Fineski, currently the museum's Senior Director of Institutional Advancement. Kate will help share with you more details around this expansion, our current growth numbers, and as well as our local and national community and economic impact. Kate. So we've got some sensitive technical issues. Let's see if this goes well. I am so excited to be here with all of you. Um, that video and this expansion really does exp inspire me. So um, let's take a moment to highlight some of the expansion details. Okay. Our second wave expansion is intended to provide much needed square footage to increase our permanent exhibit space. Thanks to a donation from Northern Michigan-based members, Bob and Nancy Sellers, our new permanent exhibit space will showcase an incredible model collection and cover themes not currently a part of our permanent exhibit. The cornerstone of our expansion, the pilot house of the St. Mary's Challenger, will provide access to a year-long pilot house experience for all visitors, including many who for various reasons are unable to access the Colonel James M. Schoonmaker Museum Ships Pilot House. At the beginning of the video we just shared, you witnessed the movement, moving of the St. Mary's Challenger Pilot House to our museum's grounds. This event took place in December of 2021, currently still being restored to its last days on the lakes. The St. Mary's Challenger, pictured here with a little red circle around it, um, on this slide is thought to be the longest sailing vessel in the world. In fact, its hull still operates today as a tug barge, 117 years later after its launch. Truly a magnificent story for all of us to share with museum visitors. The largest part of the expansion includes dedicated space for temporary exhibits, providing us with the opportunity to showcase multiple Great Lakes exhibits in one year. Exhibits that are bigger in scope and varied in topic. Finally, and the part of the expansion that I am personally nearest and uh, is closest to my heart, is the dedicated space for Great Lakes community education. These spaces together will truly help us bring more of the community to us. Expanding maritime history education to adults and future generations, something we have been preparing for and building a foundation for over the last few years. In the last decade, the National Museum of the Great Lakes has made big advances towards bringing more of the community, especially our local community, to our facilities to connect them with their maritime roots. But before I take this concept any further, let me share a quick glimpse into our operating budget. Our revenue to pay for operating expenses of this museum and our mission is derived from three primary sources, donations, memberships, and earned revenues. The latter essentially compromising of our visitation, our store sales, and any programming revenue that we generate. As you can see, earned revenue and membership make up half of our operating income, while the other half is brought through donations and grants. It's important to note that we do not rely on any annual city, county, state, or federal funds to operate this museum. Paid visitation and members, as well as the revenue they produce, are significant and very important to us. But equally as important is providing all individuals with access to our mission, which brings me back to the point in hand, our priority of connecting more individuals to their maritime roots. Our outreach and inclusion initiatives continue to grow and are touching all ages, reaching communities near and far and making big, big strides at increasing museum accessibility.
In 2023 alone, we welcomed free more than 2,500 visitors to our Martin Luther King Community Day weekend. Over 70 veterans and union employees during Memorial and Labor Days, and more than 1,400 visitors for our recent STEAM Day on September 9th. What's more, since introducing our Museums for All Access Initiative in January of this year, over 450 individuals receiving SNAP benefits have accessed our uh, free admission using their EBT cards. Additionally, we are proud to announce designation this year as a certified autism center. Next up, our Christmas tree ship event on December 2nd with free admission to all thanks to the support of the University of Toledo Medical Center. Individuals can join us to watch Santa arrive with a boatload of trees thanks to our longtime event partners at the George Grottle Company. Spectators and supporters near and far can also purchase a Christmas tree in advance for themselves or for a family in need and donate to provide family with holiday support. Plus, the University of Toledo Medical Center is going to match every donation made with a healthy hygiene kit for the community. We are building community here in East Toledo, increasing access to maritime history while also making maritime memories to last a lifetime. And the difference that we're making is growing. When we opened our doors nearly a decade ago, there was one long, lonely road leaning only to us, if you may remember that. A small but bright spot on an area along the East Bank whose potential was just beginning to be explored. You may have noticed during the past year we have been joined by the new 53-acre Glass City Metro Park, which abuts our museum's Maritime Park. Today, our closest neighbor is a world-class riverfront park and Glass City Metro Park has become one of our strongest allies, bringing visitors daily from across this community. In 2023, visitation increased more than 46%, and admission revenue is up over 22%, and still another month and a half left of the year to go. It is mind-blowing. The reality is the Glass City Metro Parks and the National Museum of the Great Lakes make a perfect pair. The Metro Parks bring Lucas County taxpayers to see their newest state-of-the-art park, and while there, they are discovering our museum. And we are bringing visitors, members, corporate partners, and more from across the Great Lakes region and beyond. And while here, these visitors are discovering the beauty of Toledo through our Metro Parks and a city skyscape view like no other. So let's take a moment to better understand this national re reach through some additional data. Since we opened in 2014, because of us, a quarter of a million people have come to the east banks of the Maumee River. Recent statistics from our Visitors Bureau, Destination Toledo, indicates that over 70% of individuals who spend at least one hour at our museum also spend at least one night in a hotel. Did you know that since we've opened here, folks from over 30 countries and across 50 states have set foot in our museum? Or how about that over 60% of our membership and 60% of our visitors are from outside of Lucas County? Another insight to our extended reach, our six annual lecture series continually sell out in person attendance. But these same presentations are also live virtually. And for any given lecture, we have anywhere from 100 to 500 devices logged on watching them live. More importantly, each year, nearly 50% of our total income is generated from sources outside of Lucas County. Think about it. This museum is bringing cash to Toledo in admission receipts, membership income, and even donations. Let me pause for a moment to let that data sink in and share an example of that national reach with a video introduction to one such family making a difference in Great Lakes history for generations through our organization.
The museum opened up their doors in Toledo, Ohio in 2014. When we moved to Toledo, we opened up as the National Museum of the Great Lakes. Our scope reaches all five Great Lakes, U.S. and Canadian history. We bring folks from across the region, across the nation, and really across the world. Over 60% of our members and visitors are located outside of Lucas County. Over 70% are spending at least one night here in hotels. We are proud that we're able to bring people to Toledo, to our community. When we think about folks that we'd like to honor, that, that deserve being honored because of how significantly they've impacted Great Lakes history, it's individuals and companies like World Shipping and the Hunger Family that allow our museum to continue to grow, to continue to touch more lives, and to continue our mission to preserve and make known the history of the Great Lakes. My grandfather was a chief engineer on board um, a lake freighter. We were always a big sailing family and, and just everything to do with the water, everything to do with the Great Lakes became such an integral part of our family life. You get on a boat or a ship, you know, and it's peaceful, it's soulful, it's, you know, calming, it's, it's the best feeling. I remember as a child, I mean, my, my, my father would go on the weekends, he would always go sailboat racing. And so as a early, early on in my childhood, I would, you know, I was drawn into sailboat racing. It's, it's such like an incredibly important part of our lives because we like we live on the water. Our company, uh, World Group, we're heavily involved in every aspect of international trade. My father, he was on his own to start he was a you know single proprietor, and then he very quickly realized that you know it's all about the team and it's all about who you surround yourself with. And here we are, uh, second generation company. My my brother John and sister Jane are in the business, and and the company has has flourished. And I'm pleased to say we've got uh, three of the next generation in the company, which is pretty cool. He started, you know, on his own and then with, you know, a partner and then it grew from there. I mean, it grew from zero. I think it's pretty cool that he, you know, saw the value in the Great Lakes. And um, I know he'd be proud, you know, of what we've continued to grow that he started. My father uh, was on the board of the Great Lakes Historical Society for years and years. And then years later, I joined the board. It was a great, great experience. Toledo is is a true Midwestern city with just great core values. I mean, Ohio at its best, really. Very appropriate spot for the National Museum of the Great Lakes. When the museum opened in Toledo, we still kept all of our members. We still kept all of those people that were invested in Great Lakes history, we just relocated to a new space. It's families like the Hunger family that have been with us for decades now as volunteers, as board members, as supporters. Folks like these are the reason why we were able to become the National Museum of the Great Lakes. We have become the National Museum of the Great Lakes in big part because of longtime partners and friends of our organization. Families like the Hungers who have built a legacy on the Great Lakes and beyond through their family's business, the World Group. From our visitors spending their hard-earned money in Toledo on hotels, food, and all the other incredible attractions Toledo has to offer, to more than 70% of our own organization's budget being spent directly in the Toledo metropolitan area. Um, uh, on vendors, suppliers, human resources, and more, we expect and know 
our local economic impact over the next five to seven years only to grow, which leads us back to our second wave expansion. Earlier, I mentioned our plans to break ground on new construction this upcoming spring, which obviously has financial ramifications. What are our financial goals and how are we making progress? We started planning for this expansion and a capital campaign just prior to the pandemic. It's important to note that at that time, we anticipated a $3.8 million cost to expand. To date, we have raised that amount and more, but post-pandemic era costs have caused a rise in the total amount needed to complete the project. The new goal number, as this slide indicates, is estimated between 5.3 and $5.5 million. We are happy to announce that we have raised over $4 million towards this expansion. Thank you. Four million, how did we get there? Let me take a moment to share just so you understand. At the end of 2020, we received a $1 million lead gift with a match incentive from Larry and Karen Betcher. Mr. Betcher, a longtime board member who resides in Vermilion, Ohio, challenged us to raise another million in cash in just one year. So in 2021, guess what? we did just that. We raised an additional $1 million to realize this full $1 million pledge from the Betchers, including over half a million dollars brought in through significant corporate gifts from Interlake Maritime Services and Cleveland Cliffs, the latter of which will soon be the namesake of our Maritime Park. Our St. Mary's Challenger historical exhibit in the new expansion wing will be named after our friends at the Schoonmaker Foundation. We've leveraged $900,000 of support through two separate State of Ohio capital budgets in 2017 and then again in 2021. And beyond that, a large group of individual and corporate partners have already shown their trust in our expansion with six-figure gifts of support. We are very, very, very proud to say that over 75% of these raised resources are derived from sources outside of Lucas County. And this revenue generated will directly benefit the people of Greater Toledo. In fact, we specifically want to acknowledge our two most recent six-figure gifts, both from outside of Lucas County. The first from Tony and Diana Zambecki, supporters of the museums who for decades, um, who reside in Vermilion, Ohio, their passion and their commitment from afar, and their, their family's dedication and love for Great Lakes history, evident after years of doting in their time, talents, and treasures to our growth. The second gift, secured less than two weeks ago, is from the Hunger Family Foundation the same family you just met in the previous video that I showed you. The Zambeckis, the Hungers, and the Betchers, they didn't need to live in Toledo to understand the value of this museum and its vision. Lastly, in addition to the above capital funds, it's important to note that we have also secured over $600,000 designated to be used to further the museum's education growth connected to our expansion. This money includes a $100,000 gift from Todd and Molly Summers, longtime supporters of the museum. Todd, a former board member in the museum's Vermilion Days, as well as a half a million dollars of transformational support from the Clement O. Miniger Memorial Foundation a foundation that has truly seen the value of our growth since we first selected Toledo as our hometown. The Summers gift and the Miniger Foundation's incredible gift not only ensures Great Lakes history is accessible and understandable for generations to come, but it means that we have secured funding for our expansion success beyond just simply bricks and mortars. We look forward to fully acknowledging all of our donors as we enter an exciting new decade of high vitality growth. 
Um, in just a moment, I'm going to turn the podium over one last time to our board vice chairman, Paul Lamar, with some additional remarks. But I'd like to end my presentation with the same slide that Chris started our presentation with. Last month, our board of directors and leadership team conducted a half-day retreat to begin work on a new strategic plan. It became abundantly clear that we all have a larger vision for this museum. If you remember this map from the beginning, Duluth, Milwaukee, Chicago, Windsor, Cleveland, Toronto, Buffalo, the National Museum of the Great Lakes could have gone anywhere. But it came to Toledo, which is also essentially the midway point between the mouth of the St. Lawrence River to our east and Duluth to the farthest point west. Our expansion will allow us the opportunity to take even more advantage of this center location here of Toledo. While attending the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Governors and Premier Conference a few weeks ago, I heard the following statement. If the Great Lakes were a country, we'd be the third largest economy in the world. From economic conversations to environmental conversations to industry conversations to history conversations, with this new expansion, the National Museum of the Great Lakes will have the space necessary to truly become a resource and option for all Great Lakes conversations to take place. So with that, I'm going to pass the podium over to Paul Lamar, Vice Chair of the National Museum of the Great Lakes and Director of the Port of Monroe, Michigan. I'm leaving the clicker in her hands. We're not going there. We're historians. We're not Hollywood producers, OK? Um, before I start here, um, I just want to say how humbling all of Chris and Kate's comments were, and all of the people that are in the room today, uh, particularly present and past board members. And I also want to note that though I am with the Port of Monroe, Michigan, I'm always wearing the Port of Toledo colors underneath. I see Mr. Kappel from the Port Authority back there. Uh, this project wouldn't be where it is without the support of the Toledo Lucas County Port Authority. And it, it really does, which is a rarity, some would say, leave me speechless. Uh, it's hard to believe how far we've come from the early days of this museum. I'm going to keep my coffee, by the way. I tell everybody that uh, coffee, cigarettes, and prayers keep tugboats running. So um, the sketch um, that we're going to see, or you see behind the vision there, that's also hanging in the lobby of the museum, is something that was done by me in 2007. Uh, 16 years ago, it's very, very hard to imagine that we had a failing museum ship and uh, that was really endangered at the time and we had a dormant building that needed greater purpose and ultimately it led to a relationship and a relationship with Chris Gilchrist and the Great Lakes Historical Society and a phone call. I will never forget the phone call where I was standing on the ship and the conversation that I had with Chris when they were looking as the Great Lakes Historical Society to create the National Museum of the Great Lakes in Lorraine. And ultimately, we had the building. We had support from the city. I see Mr. Sobzak, who was a big part of that, in the crowd today. And we had a vision. And that vision, collectively, what's crazy is that if you look at the museum today, how it has taken shape, the ship, the tug, the park, it looks exactly like the drawing. It's, it's hard to believe. Um, from a rough drawing to what you see around us today, to what we just saw through our second wave expansion, we're making big strides towards truly becoming the gathering place of the Great Lakes from both a industrial, personal, ecological standpoint. We want the Port of Toledo, the National Museum of the Great Lakes, to be the capital of the Great Lakes maritime industry. The local community, the Great Lakes region and the world at large are slowly taking notice of our impact and voice. We are excited about the positive momentum, yet this growth and increasing visitation, undoubtedly new challenges. I'm glad we have the challenges today versus the challenges that we had in 2007. How do we meet our growing demand of visitors? 
how do we support growth while at the same time continuing to grow and provide quality programming, education, and exhibits for all ages? Exhibits have changed. As I said, stuff is no longer enough. We have to be able to compete with an ever-evolving uh, tech industry and ways of entertaining folks that we have to keep history cool. Um, that mission is really, really important. Um, I want to pause for a moment, and I'm not usually a script guy, so if I'm turning pages kind of funny, I'm, I'm usually off the script, um, but I got to say, Kate is a good script. I also make Kate nervous, but that's good. <laughs> so I, I want to pause to recognize a man who none of this would be here without. Um, who has been my wingman through a very challenging process. And he was behind our original move to Toledo as an organization. And that's our executive director, Chris Gilchrist. Chris's dedication to this project is part of the fabric of every ounce, of every exhibit, of every presentation. He joined the Great Lakes Historical Society as its leader in 1999. Now, just to add color commentary, that is the year I graduated from high school, sir. <laughs> Chris has been integral to our growth uh, from the creation of the Peachman Lake Erie Shipwreck Research Program in 2000 to our museum's location change from Vermilion to Toledo to this incredible 11,000 square foot building. Chris's knowledge of Great Lakes history has fearlessly led us through it all. Chris's passion for history is institutional knowledge of this organization's mission, its expansive collection and overall scope have and will continue to be invaluable. A little over a year ago, Chris began uh, conversations for the future leadership of this museum as well as his own thoughts around eventual retirement. And now that I realized he started when I graduated from high school, I can see where that would be logical. Since opening in 2014, Chris had led this museum day in and day out and done it while residing in the community and commuting from Cleveland area. Chris and this board could not be more proud of the growth that we've seen over the past few years and now without a doubt that a big part of that growth is due to his leadership, but also our incredible staff. Let's give the staff a round of applause. So today, sip of coffee, that's important. I'm proud to talk about the future of the museum's leadership. Beginning in the new year, Chris will take on a new role as Emeritus Director at the National Museum of the Great Lakes. In this new position, he will continue to play a role in our capital and development efforts, but will also lead to the creation of a temporary and traveling exhibit program for the new gallery. He will also become the primary speaker in historic programming for the organization, assist with artifact acquisition efforts, and among other things, support the transition, as well as be an advisor to the new executive director. Alan Kennedy. Come on up here, wave. They see your smiling picture, but you have to, we, we, Alan Kennedy, the museum's current director of education and totally awesome, like the glue that keeps things together. Uh, will be the, as she's the museum's current director of education and visitor experience who joined the staff in 2015, will be elevated to the role of director of museum operations. That just sounds good. I like it. Director of museum operations. <laughs> and she deserves it. Ellen has an undergraduate and master's degree in history and museum studies and has been gradually taking on increased responsibility over the nearly nine years as a part of the museum's leadership team. In her new role, she will oversee management of much of the staff and daily operations of the facility and its activities. Finally, I'm pleased to share with you the elevation of Kate Vineski to be the new executive director of the Great Lakes Historical Society and the National Museum of the Great Lakes. Having joined the museum's leadership team 
in August of 2019. She currently oversees the organization's marketing, communications, and fundraising activities, as well as other community partnerships. With an undergraduate degree in marketing and communications, a master of business administration, and over 20 years of experience in communications, education, and nonprofit leadership, we have full confidence that Kate will take the museum to its greatest heights beyond things that I could have imagined in the beginning. And what's interesting, you see that smile. She does it with a smile on her face. When Kate started at the museum, and I can be a tough customer sometimes, I think I said to either Chris or Ellen, I'm like, is this lady really this nice? <laughs> and she is. She is like the nicest person I have ever met. She embodies kindness, joy, passion the things that we need to make history relevant. But what I want to end with, I can tell you that in 2006 and 2007, when the Willis B. Boyer was in its most rusted state, when she was destined for the scrapper's torch, at one moment I actually knelt in the pilot house of that ship and prayed that it would be saved that it would not be lost to the scrapper's torch, that we would have a champion, that we would have partners, that people would see its importance. Those videos that we just watched really actually made me quite emotional because I never could have imagined the blessings that would abound from that. Chris Gilchrist, you, sir, have been a blessing. You really have. My G hat here, you usually don't see me without it. I'm a tugboat captain for the Great Lakes Towing Company. But I'll tell you what, that G today stands for God, Gilchrist, gratefulness, and generational achievement of the National Museum of the Great Lakes. So I really appreciate your time, and I will welcome Chris back to the podium. So thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. You know, history is the study of change over time and, and who and what factors uh, influence the nature of that change. As I pre prepare to enter the next stage of my career at the National Museum of the Great Lakes, I would like to take a few seconds to acknowledge and thank the individuals who have helped us get us to this point uh, in our history. As we embark on our second wave of expansion, we must not forget the great assistance and support of the Toledo-Lucas County Port Authority and the City of Toledo for these past 10 years. We look forward to another decade of collaborative success. The success of every not-for-profit organization can be found in the level of commitment uh, of its board. I have been so lucky to work with so many great board members over these many years. Frank Samsel was our board chair from 2004 to 2007. When the research hinted that our organization could not survive in Vermilion, Frank was the first board member to vocalize the need to look elsewhere for a new home. Four board members, Larry Betcher, Tony Zembecki, Jim Karpinski, and Todd Summer, Vermilion residents all, voted to recommend to the entire board that we relocate to Toledo. To this day, I stand in awe of their courage to put the organization before their personal comfort. When we came to Toledo, Bill Buckley took a chance on us, and we are infinitely better for it. Paul Lamar, who spearheaded the saving of our museum ship, is vice chair of the board and is a constant uh, source of support. And lastly, Mark Barker, our current board chairman, proves every day that you don't need to live in a community to lead an effort to improve the quality of life in that community. I am grateful to all of our board members, current and past, that have made pr preserving Great Lakes history a joy. I would also like to acknowledge and thank our staff. It is a fantastic staff. I, I, I once said that uh, uh, Rolling Stone magazine may say that the Rolling Stones are the greatest rock and roll band of all time, but I have the greatest museum staff of all time. And it has been an honor It, the greatest honor in my life these past 25 years to work with them. You, of course, will see here and more of Kate Fineski uh, our, over the coming months, our new executive director, and I have complete
complete faith in her abilities to take us to the next level. And I look forward to helping Kate to continue our growth uh, and our record of achievement in telling the stories of our Great Lakes history. Ellen Kennedy has been with us uh, since 2015 and moved to Toledo to accept our offer. I cannot think of anybody better suited to manage the day-to-day -day operations uh, of our museum. And lastly, I would like to thank Carrie Soden, who except for me, uh, has been employed longer than any person at the organization. And longevity aside, uh, Carrie's fingerprints are everywhere in this organization over the past 20 years. And finally, as I step aside as executive director and concentrate on exhibit and content development, I would also like to thank uh, Alex Cook, a board member of Veritas, a volunteer museum curator and friend. Sorry. Uh, at 99, Alex is still supporting our mission through his art and his historical documentation and as proof that age is simply a state of mind. So with that, we will wrap up our time with you today. I would also like to thank uh, Buckeye Cable and uh, uh, the BCAN Network for helping us live stream this to uh, all of our members uh, and invited guests. And uh, would also like to thank you for joining us here today at the museum for our first State of the Museum address. We are so proud to work with uh, uh, the work we are doing to connect our community to its maritime roots. Thank you for playing a role in our growth and our second wave of expansion. Thank you all so much. Thank you.